your life. Hello, everyone. Hi, this is uh, Sanket Vaidya. I'm a part of uh, Persistent Campus HR team. Uh, I'm sure all of you are doing fine and staying safe. Uh, I would like to wish you a very happy new year. We are, we are meeting for the first time in this 2021. So I would um, want all of you to be uh, settled well while we are trying to start set up this thing. Um, this is our fifth webinar. We are coming up again with uh, Career Recropedia, which is a part of um, Persistent Engagement for Enhanced Partnerships. Uh, I'm sure you would have been a part of these webinars before as well. Uh, we've had Dr. Anand followed by Samir. Uh, then we had Brijesh. Um, so likewise, we've been having then we had Venki. And today we have an interesting session for all of you. Um, this is going to be more on the on the technology side um, from an artificial intelligence, which is one of the prominent and favorite subjects for all the students nowadays. Um, so without wasting much time, I'm going to move on to my next slide and I'm going to introduce you to the presenter, right? So um, hi everyone. I would welcome uh, Mr. Dattaraj Rao. He is the head for AI research for persistent uh, CTO office, which is chief uh, computer technology office that we have. And uh, we're going to be presenting. He's going to be talking and speaking about building a responsible artificial intelligence system, right? Just to give you a brief about uh, Dattaraj, Dattaraj is an author of a book uh, which is called as Keras to Kubernetes, right? Uh, that's the journey of machine learning model to production. Dattaraj also leads the AI research lab at Persistent and is based out of Goa. Right. Um, one of the favorite destinations for all of us. Uh, he has been responsible and is currently responsible for driving thought leadership in AI and ML across the company. Uh, he leads a team that explores the state of art in natural language understanding, reinforcement learning, explainable artificial intelligence, machine learning operations and demonstrate applicability to healthcare, banking, industrial domains, etc. Previously, he also worked at uh, General Electric, GE. I'm sure you guys are aware about it. For 19 years, uh, some of you would be just a couple of years uh, younger than this, building industrial IoT solutions to uh, for predictive maintenance, digital twins and machine vision. Uh, he also had held a lot of uh, technology leadership roles at Global Research, GE Power, uh, transportation, it's a part of Vaptec. Uh, he led the innovation team out of Bangalore that incubated video track inspection from an idea to a commercial product. Interestingly, uh, Dattaraj has 11 patents in machine learning. Right? So I'm sure it's going to be a very uh, uh, good experience for all of you to know more about this particular technology. For some of you may have some idea. But um, I will now hand it over to um, Dattaraj. In the meanwhile, before we hand, uh, hand over, we've got a good amount of people who are joining us. So in case if there are any internet issues, please bear with us. You will probably get the um, recording also of this. So um, over to you, Dattaraj, and um, wishing you a very good session for today. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sanket, uh, for the great introduction. Uh, kind introduction, I should say. Um, and hi, hi, everybody. Happy New Year to all of you. And uh, I'll start this session. I have a lot of content to cover, so let me get right to it. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about uh, responsible AI. Uh, what What is the need for responsible AI? I'm sure uh, in your uh, 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 curriculum, as well as uh, if some of you are from industry, uh, in your work, you have come across AI, at least some aspects of AI. So we will look at what is the need for this new thing called responsible AI. Uh, we look at some of the AI ethics case studies, which uh, I'm sure if you are following the news, you would have heard in the news and uh, uh, I'll try to focus on the AI ethics aspect of it. Uh, then we'll talk about our pillars of responsible AI and uh, I'll try to not keep it too technical or wordy. I'll try to focus a lot on ex real world examples that you see. So I, uh, my goal is to kind of uh, give you an overview of this field and this is something you can take back uh, to your uh, research or work area and actually start thinking of when you're thinking of building AI models, 
how how uh, AI ethics and responsible AI can be applied to your domain. I think that is if you if I can get you thinking in that direction, that I would say is a success of this talk. So that's the, going to be the focus area, and uh, I, I hope I can keep you interested uh, because this is not a like a cool AI topic like neural networks or uh, generative edit editive networks or something like that. Uh, so that uh, this cartoon I got from my LinkedIn friend uh, Murat uh, Durmos. So I'm hoping that I'll I'll ma ma manage your interest throughout the session, and I do have some good examples on that. So let's let's get started. So first of all, um, now uh, I'm probably preaching to a choir here. Uh, AI is everywhere. You see AI applied in all aspects of uh, the industry today. Uh, we at Persistent focus a lot on healthcare. We kind of are uh, really applying cutting edge AI, AI algorithms to precision medicine, uh, clinical care, etc. Banking, finance, and insurance. BFSI is a major uh, area for us. Uh, we look at how the different loan approvals processes, the banking process. Can be improved using artificial intelligence, uh, e-commerce, social media, agriculture. I mean, you name it, and AI is in that particular area. I mean, there is a lot of talk these days in uh, uh, in the US, particularly about self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles. I come from a from GE, where we worked a lot on uh, uh, locomotives, and uh, there is a major initiatives where they are looking at driverless or uh, a single driver locomotive, where you can actually control a locomotive just. Through uh, advanced uh, sensors and artificial intelligence, so you name it, and AI has uh, influenced that area. So whatever your field of study, I'm sure AI can you can see the in, in, impact of AI right now or in the coming years. So then, uh, uh, so then we have. So why do you need responsible AI? So uh, we see this uh, new term that uh, that is being thrown out everywhere. Data is the new one. So more than uh, the actual uh, in, in industries. The companies that have the data, they are actually making so much money. Companies like Google, uh, Amazon, they are making, they are monetizing their data and making money out of the data. So uh, this term is being, this sentence is being coined that data is the new oil. And uh, Dr. Andrew Ng kind of coined this term that AI is the new electricity. So having data is great, but you really need to convert that into something useful like uh, electricity to actually make uh, value from it. So these two terms you'll definitely hear everywhere. Data is the new oil, and AI is the new electricity. But then, uh, like uh, you hear in the Spider-Man movies, with great power comes great responsibility. So we also hear headlines like this: like, uh, hey, uh, yeah, there was a facial recognition software which was biased against certain uh, individuals, or there was a flawed algorithm which actually made. I mean, this is something you probably would relate. If there was a uh, algorithm that your university uses to grade students, and what if there was a bias? It used something that other than your academic capabilities, some non uh, uh, non critical factor, and use that to rate students. I mean, that would be very unfair. You wouldn't like that. So uh, we see as and as and more and more AI adoption happens, we are seeing uh, a need to have algorithms follow the social uh, ethical principles and not have bias towards uh, un unwanted factors. And that is what has evolved into this new field of. So earlier, a lot of focus was on AI ethics. But uh, in, in my mind, uh, the, uh, responsible AI is even beyond that. There are other implications like uh, data privacy. Like when uh, to build AI systems, you need a lot of data that is being collected. Like uh, today, you see Amazon or Fitbit collect so much data from you. Now that is your data. You have generated the data. Now how they are really using that data to to build outcomes for their customers. But then. Uh, who owns the data? Are you responsible for the data? And how is that data handled privacy? So a lot of these questions are being asked today in the industry. And uh, and I really think uh, you, you people from the academia, I mean, uh, upcoming AI uh, ML engineers like yourself will be in the right place. Because uh, to be very honest from the industry, this is an area we need a lot of help in. We, we need a lot of thought. How, how do you handle the AI ethics principle? I mean, how do you make sure these things don't happen where we build algorithms that are biased? When we, when we design algorithms, how can we focus on ethics and uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 lack of bias to make sure that uh, our algorithms are fair and fairness is maintained. So that is what has uh, driven to this new field of responsible AI. Uh, so uh, let me show, take some uh, quick examples. I mean, uh, this is something that featured in an article in MIT Technology Review. I mean, you see these beautiful faces. But one thing uh, you will notice if you read that article is none of these people are real. So this is an AI algorithm that has taken faces of uh, celebrities predominantly and uh, kind of uh, not just mix them. I mean, you can say you can take somebody's eyes and uh, take somebody's uh, nose, but you will not get a really a beautiful image. 
I mean, that's the kind of you can you can vouch that you can see that. But then what this algorithm has done is it has learned the features of how a face is constructed. So this is using a technology called generative adversarial uh, uh, networks GANs, and uh, using these technologies, it is actually generating new content, and it has evolved so much that the content is now indistinguishable. You cannot tell that this is not a real person. It is a mix of certain features uh, of uh, different individuals. So these are generated uh, images uh, that the AI has generated from uh, uh, from uh, by learning from existing images. The same thing has happened with uh, text. So there are new models like GPT-3, the Generative Pre-trained Transformer uh, version 3, but it can write poetry for you. I mean, it can uh, take a steep text and generate text which is indistinguishable from a human. So we are we are at a stage where AI can actually beat the Turing test. It can generate content that is uh, indistinguishable from humans. Now that makes it all the more important to have certain governance model principles and AI ethics to make sure that these are not used for a uh, for adversarial uh, reason. For example, if somebody takes an image generated by an AI or, AI or a text generated by AI and sends you a message and fools you, I mean that is a violation of a of your uh, privacy and your uh, is a violation of the ethical principle. So how do you control that? These are the things that we need to start thinking as data scientists and engineers building AI systems. These are the things we need to start thinking on how do we uh, manage uh, the responsible AI aspects. And there are two aspects to it. One is there is a direct impact, which is the systems, the AI systems that we are building. How do we make sure that these are bias free and how do you build the systems that are fair? So uh, this is uh, something like uh, uh, like I talked about the privacy concerns. We are collecting so much data from us. How do we make sure that the data, data is collected, uh, kept private? It is not shared, uh, that it is not needed. And there is an accountability and a transparency to, to our models. And then there is the social impact where uh, like because of AI, definitely you'll hear that, that there are there'll be a loss of jobs, but then new jobs will be created. Things like deep fakes, I mean, these things, uh, like deep fakes can uh, can fool people. Now, how do you account for that? So there are systematic and social impacts of AI, and that is the reason why we need uh, principles of responsible AI. So uh, at Persistent, this is a major initiative for us, and we kind of see a lot of uh, when we work with government or major banking or uh, healthcare companies, they they definitely respect the need for ethics and uh, responsible AI, and we have a lot of initiatives which I'll talk about it during the talk. Uh, around how to, uh, while we are building AI models, how to make sure that they are ethical and responsible. Uh, in India also, I mean, you must be hearing this in the news. There's a lot of focus on governance of AI and making sure AI is fair, especially with the, you'll see uh, uh, these articles published uh, by uh, Prime Minister Modi and uh, uh, Honorable Minister Ravi Shankar Prasad, but they, 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 uh, they are already realizing that the, uh, along with the accuracy and the, technical uh, uh, show of AI, you really want to have models which are uh, which have ethics and responsible responsible AI in the mix. So in fact, uh, for uh, we actually have a responsible AI for your program that was launched. If you see this headline uh, by Government of India had launched a program where 11,000 students from schools were educated by this. Some of you probably attended that program also. So these kind of initiatives are now being started to have a uh, while AI is being used for social good to make sure AI is responsible. <clears throat> Sorry, and uh, uh, and ethical aspects of AI is, is meant. <clears throat> so with that, uh, uh, let me just talk a little bit about some of the case studies. And uh, like I said, the first half would be would be more of a general discussion on AI ethics, and then uh, more technical aspects I have kept at the end. But I I do give a lot of uh, references at the end, so you will have uh, this material at the end to, where you can go through, and uh, I'll give my uh, my. Um, LinkedIn profile or Twitter handle also, so you can uh, we can have an offline discussion also if a particular area interests you. So first example is this famous example of uh, ProPublica. Now this is one of the one of the first cases which brought this uh, machine bias uh, to the forefront. Uh, this is actually a Compass software, which was a software that is used in the US for kind of predicting if a criminal. So the criminal justice system implemented this software and it used an algorithm which would uh, look at different factors, like uh, a person has committed crime before. What is the uh, age of the person? What is the race? Uh, what is the area? Uh, uh, what is the area where they live? Uh, and if they have com committed crime before and things like that. So take a bunch of factors and try to predict if a person uh, will be high risk for committing crime in the future or a low risk. 
and you can see from this example and you can this is a very interesting article you would uh, i'll highly encourage you to go through this uh, article in the link that i have given so it will takes like a uh, this uh, long story short this algorithm was biased towards a particular race uh, so it was more uh, caucasian friendly and a person of color would probably get a lower score from this algorithms and this was highly pointed there was a big study done by propublica and uh, they uh, sent this report to north point who owned the compass software and they kind of there was back and forth there was a lawsuit around this and then uh, the compass has stopped being used so uh, this was an example you could see that uh, this person uh, showed as a low risk while this uh, uh, the other person was shown as a high risk but then uh, uh, because he was there was a smaller crime but he was shown as a very high risk and they actually ended up i believe they ended up arresting the person without even um, uh, without even a cause of that person has done any crime so this this sort of bias so there was an algorithm which was biased uh, against certain factors and those factors should not be the ones making the decision so imagine an ai trying to uh, decide if you you should be arrested or no i mean that there itself uh, it has to be a fair algorithm as to the, does not have to have any biases so that was the first example the second example talks a lot about explainability of ai system so along with the fairness and bias one another major aspect of responsible ai is explainability i mean typically uh, people are very happy with ai neural networks adding more and more layers to neural networks and making them analyze text images etc but then as you have this bigger networks you really can't explain them you don't know why a particular decision was made why a class was uh, flagged as a particular uh, category now this is okay when you're predicting and taking an image and saying it's a cat or a dog so hey you missed a prediction or uh, so that's fine i mean that's like a uh, you can pass on uh, that hey it made a mistake but then this becomes very important when you actually classifying people for loan or for uh, for criminal uh, for for uh, chances of uh, committing the crime again so uh, explainability of ai ai models is very important and one of the major pillars of responsible ai so this is a classic example that comes up when we talk about explainable ai uh, these are two classifiers that were trained uh, from a research paper here and you can see the youtube video for the uh, reference uh, so they were trying to classify the distinguish between wolf and husky so husky is i guess like a type of a wolf but then it's not a pure fully a wolf so they were trying to classify between a wolf and a husky and uh, we see that uh, uh, that the first classifier the, the, the two classifiers though they both had the same uh, accuracy rate the first classifier uh, if you look uh, so we used a technique so the researchers used a technique where they would say uh, why why was the classification being made what were the pixels of importance because of which that classification was made and they found out that the first classifier was only looking at snow so uh, because the uh, i believe the husky was found only when the, there was regions of snow so it will just say look at the snow and classify it as a particular class while the second classifier would look at the characteristics of the wolf and uh, say it's a wolf or a husky so second was a more uh, more uh, ethically correct classifier while the first was taking a non important factor like snow and classifying the uh, animal so th these so this is an example where we really need explainability you need to know which uh, portion of the image was studied by the classifier and why was that decision made so this is an example of exp the explainable ai and uh, a lot of companies especially darpa in the united states have dedicated initiative where they focus on explainability they are focusing on explainability of ml models uh, different models from image in text as well as uh, numerical models and trying to build algorithms that are either interpretable where the algorithm itself tells you why it made the decision or building uh, kind of a pseudo algorithms which can explain some of these uh, decisions made by uh, black box models so that's kind of under the realm of explainability the final example i'll just quickly talk about is the amazon's uh, recruitment tool so amazon kind of deployed a very interesting ai recruitment tool which was uh, trying to make a decision of hiring again you can see a very important decision and needs ethical uh, fairness and uh, not uh, should be free from bias but then uh, because of the historic because of the historical data that was fed to the tool this uh, ai tool was biased against uh, women and uh, it was proven by amazon itself i believe that uh, this uh, was favoring male candidates and they stopped using the tool so these are some of the real world examples how important ai is and then uh, how a bias plays a major role in the decision 
uh, of ai and how the social social economic factors are important and uh, bias should be considered for study so as creators of artificial intelligence uh, all of us especially the student community we have a duty to make sure we understand what are the ethics and bias implications of ai and how it fits with our social values and make sure we while we design this algorithms we need to give a serious thought to bias and fairness in algorithms so i hope i mean this is the main message from for this talk and i'll show you how how this can be done how the uh, uh, bias fairness can be measured what are some of the uh, factors the libraries that can be used and then how you can actually show that your model is free from bias so i'll i'll talk about some real world examples also but this is the message i would really want all of us to take from this talk and uh, like sanket said uh, please do keep questions coming it does need not be a technical question it can be a general uh, what you think about uh, the, uh, the socio economic factors we can definitely have a debate on that so with that uh, let me jump to the pillars of uh, responsible ai now uh, this is something every company including persister you see the big players microsoft google they are all talking of different aspects of responsible ai and uh, you may see the little bit difference there may be five or six categories but overall this is what we see you will see at a high level this is how responsible ai will fit into the uh, uh, to start with uh, your ai system should be reproducible now this is a big uh, debate in the research community this what happens is uh, now with the growing ai importance there are so many research papers being published and as part of research papers and i'm sure in the academia you guys also will be may have already or will be publishing so many so much great research but while you're publishing uh, you need to make sure your results that you are showing in the paper are reproducible many times a paper gets published and when you actually run those that analysis that algorithm on a on the data set you don't get the same results they claim 99% and you get like a 70% accuracy so that so reproducible reproducibility of ai models is very important it becomes very important for us when we talk to a banking firm or a healthcare firm we need to build ai systems which can be reproduced and uh, can show that this is the this is the reason i get this accuracy number on this data set so this gets into things like uh, data and model cataloging now many times you have this uh, uh, very good data set which is on uh, in a csv file but then sorry uh, but then you you need to really uh, make sure that there is a catalog of data where you can say that uh, when i uh, publish this accuracy it is against this data catalog and this is the entry uh, this is the version of data set i am using so that a, a, another researcher or industry professional can use the same version of data set same also goes with model catalogs when you are publishing models and these models ultimately get integrated with the software system and uh, start making prediction you need to know what version of the model uh, particular prediction is being especially when we are talking about bias you need to know what version of the uh, of the model is there in production and then uh, does that have certain biases and what new version you can deploy so reproducibility becomes very important transparency we talked about uh, you need models that are interpretable that are explainable and then i'll show an example uh, of a library where we have this matrix of ai fairness where uh, a lot of times what happens is because your data set itself the training data that you use has bias so the training data itself like if you to use a training data for say loan prediction and if i have only 30% uh, data from women and out of that most of them have been rejected for some reason uh, for the loan then automatically your ai model will have a bias against that particular category so you have to have some technical intervention by which you consider that bias against uh, an unwanted uh, feature and how do you mitigate that bias so i'll show some techniques of how you can mitigate some of these uh, bias in your data set accountability is very important so as you get build a responsible ai system as you build a ai system that is transparent ultimately you need to bring the human in the loop so uh, this is and you have to have st strict policies on how the ai system will operate so bringing the human in the loop having a a policy having the right metrics right monitors is very important so account accountability is a, is a very important uh, area and there are now uh, companies forming ai ethics committees uh, where they actually evaluate how the ai systems are which are being deployed and make sure that the ethical and socio economic guidelines are followed before deployment happens and then the last two aspects i mean these kind of uh, 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 don't directly uh, uh, are related to some of the reproducibility transparency and accountability but they are very important and should be considered part of responsible ai is security and uh, privacy privacy is around privacy of the user data like i have my data especially around uh, areas of healthcare when my data is in a data set 
uh, for a particular uh, healthcare now the company may be using that to build machine learning models but i need assurance that they are not building models that memorize my data so some attacker can come in look at that machine learning model and extract my uh, 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 my specific data values so pr- protecting the user data is very important and i'm sure when you look at companies like amazon they look at the transaction that you have made you don't want companies to be extracting uh, 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 intimate details of your transactional data and trying to uh, give you suggestions so pr- protecting the privacy of the data uh, is very important and there are techniques like predictive learning differential privacy i'll talk about that uh, and security of the data like uh, we always uh, test our systems thoroughly to make sure they are uh, uh, robust against adversarial inputs but with ai it takes this at a different level we are also have to test for uh, adversarial attacks somebody may learn the training data from the from the uh, uh, from our model that is deployed or even actually use that model for an uh, for unwanted purposes so uh, security of the data is also very important and we need to consider that as part of uh, responsible ai so with that uh, let me just uh, take uh, see how these things actually work uh, in the real world and then i'll show some use cases so typically the way a data scientist would work on an ai and uh, focusing only on machine learning here so we we have this data management uh, you you collect your data ideally you would have a catalog of data or at least some version csv files in github or something that you pull your data set or uh, s3 bucket you build a model and then you typically have this uh, now uh, the algorithms are pretty much commoditized so you use either a random forest or some assembler algorithm to build your model and then you have a uh, your own versioning so you typically have your like uh, J- jenkins or one of your software life ci cd uh, packages to deploy your software so this model kind of becomes like a black box which gets attached uh, as a binary to your uh, software and then that's get deployed into production and then uh, a production software system would have certain logging now uh, along with the ml model typically you don't have uh, a specialized logging for a ml model so you would just uh, uh, connect uh, the logs of the software system and start looking at things but then uh, a thought on metrics is very important and this is a very simple uh, diagram i'm sure you you are aware of this is a confusion matrix that will just tell you the true versus predicted what is the distribution so at least uh, what you do typically today is you make sure your data scientist make sure you achieve the right accuracy matrix so if acceptable is about 95% you do reach that matrix on training data uh, apply it on validation data you verify that your validation data meets the right matrix and then you are ready to deploy it you deploy the model to production but uh, a new paradigm is evolving on this called uh, ml ops so like right uh, like there is devops where you are looking at uh, m- making your development and operations more agile and as you uh, you automatically deploy software into production you monitor the metrics and uh, quickly have overnight builds of software deployment uh, similarly we are looking at things like uh, ml ops where you follow the similar principle for uh, machine learning system now building a software system and an ml system is very different i mean that is that has been recognized so the principles that are used are very different so here you need to have put a data scientist hat on and look at how are you going to uh, extract features to the feature engineering from your data set how are you going to do the model deployment and what sort of versioning you, you, you got to do and that is where you kind of that is where the a uh, lot of facets of reproducibility that we talked earlier comes in so you you uh, you typically focus on uh, so more companies now are focusing on things like data catalogs and model catalogs data catalog will contain the data as well as it will also have some opinion on the uh, on the distribution of data so if you have certain features it will store like uh, in this case it is showing a box plot it will show some it will sh- uh, save some of these uh, distributions of how the data set is uh, is distributed in the training as well as validation data set so you know when you are building a ml model uh, this is the data set that was consumed by your ml model and then this is the version of the model and that typically ties into a ci cd system now modern ci cd systems can integrate directly with your ml systems and we can have deployment and we we have at uh, persistent have been building this uh, ml ops is a major initiative for us and we have been building some of these uh, systems that focus heavily on reproducibility to make sure you have a flow, uh, smooth pipeline for ml ops so reproducibility is very important uh, you focus here a lot on metrics comparison of algorithms and deployment the next aspect is transparency so uh, uh, you are able to reproduce the algorithm but what is happening behind the scene so uh, what we have done is along with the ml ops cycle we are also integrating 
explanations. So uh, this is actually a demo, and I have a video talk that I had done at NCUBE where I can sh where I had shown this demo. In interest of time, I won't show it here, but uh, I have given a link to the YouTube video. You can have a look at the video where we actually walk through these top steps. So second, the aspect is transparency, and we are looking at explanations so along with metrics. You also verify the explanations, and this is where the AI ethics committees come into place, where you can say, hey. Okay, uh, you have the right metrics, but then what, uh, uh, is it uh, focusing? And this is a chart, uh, this is a shape curve of the features that your model is uh, using to make decisions. So is it making decisions on the right features? And as long as that is happening, let's uh, deploy the model. And then while in production, you're looking at monitoring either the data drift and the concept drift. So data drift is how the distribution of data changes. So like this, uh, in your data catalog, you will know what is your distribution of your data. Now, similarly in production, when you log, along with logging your software features, like there is a uh, there's a Java exception or something like that, while you're logging those errors, you also want to log the distribution of your data so that you know that compared to the model data catalog, this is a data drift that has happened. And how do you mitigate the data drift? Is your model robust enough to manage this data drift or do you need to retrain your model? And then concept drift is even more important with where actually your relationship between your data and the feature changes. So now this is something where you definitely need, most likely need retraining and you can typically you monitor the accuracy of your model. So if somehow you have a way to uh, in production to uh, measure the ground truth after the decision has been made, so after you make a prediction, if you can measure the ground truth and you can uh, plot the accuracy over time, if you know that the accuracy is falling, you can know where at what point you are to retrain. Now this again becomes part of the MLOps CI/CD cycle, where you know that at this point there's a data drift, there's a concept drift. You trigger a retraining, and it goes back, uh, retrains your model, and deploys a new model. So you're seeing how all this fits into uh, the reproducibility and transparency fits into your MLOps cycle. And the last piece of this is accountability. Now uh, you can make these decisions, but there needs to be a human intervention, a human in the loop to see. Uh, at what point do you make this decision? I mean, what is the metric below which the accuracy falls? You you term it as a concept drift and start sending it for retraining, or at what point uh, is, your, is your data distribution data drift big enough that you are uh, triggering retraining or rebuilding of your ML model? And also basic things like uh, I'm sure uh, as an AI professional you will know the different metrics like precision recall, the true positive rate, the false positive rate, etc. Uh, in healthcare, there are things like sensitivity, uh, uh, specific, specificity, things like that. So you, you need to know what metrics are you going to measure and log those metrics. So modern, uh, there are systems like H2O.ai or MLflow, which can help you log those metrics. So uh, you need to have an AI ethics committee, even if it is an ethics committee of one person. Uh, you need to have somebody to look at what is your what is it that your AI systems are measuring? What are the uh, features that it is getting biased towards? Is it ethically correct? Those that bias, or it is an unfair bias, and uh, conduct some of these fairness reviews and integrate it with your MLOps CI/CD system. So this is actually what the modern ML system would look like. Uh, more than the accuracy, more than the wow factor of demos, uh, this is how ML systems would be integrated in production, focusing on the three key pillars: reproducibility, transparency, and accountability. Uh, uh, so let, let's let's take an example of this, and this is something again. Like I said in the, my NCube talk, I have this as a demo because I had some more time on this. But uh, 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 I can uh, I can uh, kind of give you references for this. So uh, there are multiple tools. So uh, uh, typically, like I said earlier, uh, a bias in the AI system comes from the data set. So there are tools available to measure the fairness of of your uh, of your data set. So fairness in the sense uh, it can do a grouping and say. Uh, if there is a protected attribute like uh, in this case race. So this example is using uh, IBM's AI Fairness 360 library. I have a link for that in this uh, slide. So AI Fairness 360 is a, is a very nice tool. I, I highly encourage you to go online, have a look at the tool. There is online demo. I mean, these snapshots are from an online demo where you can select a data set. And this is a data set actually of the first example, the ProPublica example I gave of the Compass tool. So this is an example of the Compass data set. And I'm looking at race as an attribute and uh, typically when you do fairness study you have a privilege group and unprivileged group so uh, any any anybody uh, caucasian i'm keeping it as a privileged group uh, non caucasian i'm keeping it as an unprivileged group and it it gives you a 66% accuracy but then there are some special metrics 
which are beyond your precision recall, uh, which try to divide this data into different groups based on race and try to give you metrics. So this is beyond your standard accuracy metrics. You look at things like, and in the actual tool, you can click on this uh, 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 icon and you, it will tell you the definition of each of these metrics. So these are some of the, and, and of course, Google has a what if analysis tool, which does the exact same thing. But uh, the metrics remain the same. They just the small terminology that changes. So you can you can choose to use whichever tool you want. But the key thing is, uh, you need to look at metrics like in this case statistical parity difference, where it looks at between the groups, between a privileged group and an unprivileged group. What is the statistical uh, parity? Is there a big, bigger selection rate for a privileged group compared to a non-privileged group? Only looking at a selection rate, not looking at the accuracy. So things like uh, your disparate impact analysis and statistical parity difference looks at that uh, things like equal opportunity difference and average or difference looks at your true positive rate. And uh, I, I believe equal opportunity looks only at the true positive rate. Average or looks at true positive as well as, as well as false positive. And you can look up the definition. So it looks at true positive rate between the different groups, privileged and non-privileged, and tries to see if there is a disparate impact that between the groups, there is a different way of uh, how the data set is handled. And then uh, the, the good thing about this library is it also tells you on a chart that if it is fair or biased. So in this case, you see that uh, probably the disparate impact is, is becoming fair, but then certain other aspects is getting into the bias region. So Thales index is talking about uh, entropy. So then, uh, so, so you can look at a metric and if it is getting more towards bias, there are some technical interventions that you can do to uh, improve upon the bias. Now, uh, some of the, uh, the technical intervention that you can do can be at the data data set level that you can resample or reweight the reweight the data. You can do it at the classifier level. So there is a adversarial debiasing technique where you actually change the way you are classifying by considering a bias towards the you know, privileged group, or you can do something at the predictions level. So there is a technique where you can uh, uh, you can reject the samples which are at a threshold. So if the sample is at a if the if the prediction is at the threshold, you can reject it if it is belonging to a privileged group. So things like that you can apply and there are different parameters for this. So AI Fairness 360 gives you a full library which can measure these fairness metrics for you between privileged and privileged groups. It can apply the technical intervention and there are a bunch of other libraries also. I, I mean, I, I like AI Fairness 360 because it's a nice online demo, but there are a bunch of, uh, and this is again by uh, my friend Moro, uh, where th there are a bunch of people from Google, IBM, Microsoft, uh, there's Interpret ML from Microsoft. Uh, PwC has a responsible AI toolkit. So you can, uh, so he, he has given in this ex, in this PDF document links to all this toolkit, so you can kind of evaluate them. There's Audit AI, which is a more of an open source, a very good tool for bias testing. Uh, so either I would highly encourage go to the IBM AI Fairness 360 page or look at some of the other tools in this page and uh, start getting familiar with this. At least uh, get familiar with the concepts like uh, disparate impact, statistical parity, and uh, technical interventions like uh, reweighing. So because that will really help you while you're building ML models to make sure you're handing the data set that is fair. And, and uh, this is a case study that uh, we did at Persistent where we were applying a ML ops pipeline and we took a data open data set from Kaggle for uh, for loan prediction. So there was a there was a uh, we had two versions of the data set. We doctored the data set. So first version uh, gave a, a very good accuracy about uh, I believe it was like 97% uh, accuracy. The second one also had a uh, 97 or even bigger uh, accuracy in fact it's uh, 94 and 91 so second version had a little lower accuracy but it was we treated it as a more recent data set so imagine you have an ai system that is deployed in production uh, you uh, collect metrics from this system you measure the accuracy you are happy with this now you continuously keep collecting sample data sets from your production data and then once you get a production data and you compare the uh, metric and they say, hey, this accuracy is also good, but it's a recent data set. So let's use this for tra training your model. But when you do a, uh, so in this MLOps pipeline, we also had explainable AI as part of this pipeline. So we we had this uh, SHAP library. SHAP is a Shapley uh, library, which kind of calculates uh, Shapley scores, uh, which is inspired by game theory for every training sample. And what it gives you is it gives you charts like this, which tells you the feature importance, like the one that I saw, uh, showed earlier. So in this chart, you could see that for the first data set, which was collected more like a, a historical data, uh, it was focusing on credit history, property area, and this was a loan prediction, predicting if the loan would be approved uh, based on certain features. 
so uh, looking at credit history uh, uh, looking at the loan amount uh, and things like that. so okay. looking at relevant feature it was biased towards credit history and some some important features so which could be as an ai ethics person i would approve this this is this seems fair but if you look at the dataset version 2 which is more recent which is giving us a very good accuracy also you see that uh, it is biased towards the gender it is biased towards if you are married so married probably is uh, is something that uh, you would consider for loan but then uh, it should not be biased towards a gender so this is something this would raise a red flag if you had a ai ethics review so uh, as an ML, uh, ml ops cycle if you had a ml ops cycle like this which will take your data set the latest data set that you are evaluating run an ml ops cycle and show you this chart uh, show this report to an ai ethics com committee then they would be able to easily red flag that this is not something you want your models to be biased on let's revisit this data set or recollect a new data set so this is an example of a case where you would apply uh, explainability to make sure your models are not biased so this was a small example and like i said i have a web demo of this uh, as part of my mcube talk it's on youtube and i'll give a link after this so the next aspect is uh, we talk we talk mainly about reproducibility accountability and uh, transparency the next two aspects of it is uh, privacy and security and i won't spend a lot of time on this but uh, this is more on terms of uh, uh, how you keep your data private and your uh, model secure so uh, Uh, so the, so few few aspects that we are looking at from privacy uh, and uh, security is federated learning so federated learning is, is an emerging pattern of training your ml models so this is an example of, uh, uh, of how federated learning would happen so uh, imagine this is like a hospital scenario there are, and with the recent covid uh, pandemic imagine there are like three hospitals in three different parts of the country and one of the hospital has more cases on covid and so they are building ml models that are actually learning how the covid is impacting certain patients now if they want to share their findings with a different party different hospital they would need to provide their data set as it is and this people have to build models around it so, so now that and and uh, so that becomes a big limitation because the data set is uh, is high private it belongs to the patients of that that region and that hospital so we don't want to share the data set so uh, federated learning is a design pattern by which you, you can build a machine learning model without sharing your data you only share your model weights so those familiar with neural networks you build a neural network by training the weights using things like gradient descent uh, so these weights that are that the neural network has learned you just share the weights among uh, the different model so this is a very uh, tech, a very powerful technique getting getting popularity where there's a federated aggregator it collects data from this different nodes shares your uh, model updates and typically these model updates are just aggregated using average or summation of the different up updates and we find that the insights that are learned at one node are easily replicated to a different node so this is becomes very powerful without the data leaving your party machine you are sharing your insights the machine learning insights to a different node so this is a very powerful paradigm uh, this is being used uh, heavily by google or uh, and uh, apple using the keyboard applications so make sure the keyboard learns better when you type in they don't want to share the your private conversations so they use federated learning especially google gboard it uses federated learning to kind of share this insights between uh, different uh, between different machines and aggregate it centrally without sharing your private conversation so this is a, a very uh, interesting area on uh, making sure the data is private security is around more of uh, uh, again this uh, this brings in security because uh, the data remains and on a node but uh, there are other aspects of security also there are things like confidential computing i'll talk a little bit about it which talk, which focus more on security but uh, federated learning there are different uh, platforms like ibm has a very powerful federated learning platform there is pyshift uh, nvidia has clara uh, so these different platforms are uh, you can in fact uh, these platforms are already available you can directly try this out and uh, 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 use federated learning to kind of uh, train models in a decentralized and uh, this is an offering from persistent so this is something that we built uh, along with our ml ops strategy uh, we are very big on security security and uh, privacy of ai so this is an offering that we have developed and uh, i have a talk which talks uh, i have a talk by amok tarkar which talks about some of these uh, 
how these different uh, uh, offerings are working together. And uh, he was, was presented at ODSC conference 2020. I have a YouTube video on that. And I highly, highly encourage you to look at that video because that would really tell you some of these things uh, in action. But a brief overview. Uh, we have something called privacy analysis because uh, as you're building model, you don't want your, data, your ML models to memorize the data set. So privacy analysis tells you if that um, ML model from the training data, you can, uh, if somebody can infer that that uh, training data was part, was used to build a model. So the, it's technically called membership inference attack. So it tries to measure uh, if the uh, give a uh, privacy metric saying that uh, this model is free from membership inference attacks. Uh, you we use differential privacy. The differential privacy essentially is keeping making your data more private by adding some sort of statistical noise. So that uh, when uh, because of the noise that is added, it could be added at the data set level. Like typically when iOS collects your uh, health records, they add some uh, statistical noise uh, so that your records are not compromised. So this happens. This is typically so there is a, something called a privacy budget. So depending on the privacy budget, they add certain noise to your data so that uh, individual uh, your individual records may not be uh, unraveled by a third party who, uh, who has access to this data. So uh, we kind of show you how differential privacy works, how to add noise, and how to manage the privacy budget. Uh, Faraday learning, like I talked about, when there are multiple parties without sharing data, you share insights. We have a nice demo on Faraday learning as part of that talk by Amo. Uh, a few other aspects on security. A secured multi-party computation where if you have three people participating in a computation, you're calculating something, uh, you can build, you can make that computation such that none of the parties can know each other. You're kind of uh, use some secret sharing mechanism. So you, you divide the data set among the parties without one party knowing them. Uh, other aspects is homomorphic encryption where you're running computations on encrypted data. If you want to, if you don't want to share your data set, but still want to run some calculation on it, you can keep it encrypted, run a computation, get your data back. We we are working with some uh, libraries on homomorphic encryption, encryption and seeing how it applies. And finally, confidential computing. This is a very emerging field in security domain. Uh, we have the security enclaves, which are cryptographically hidden. So as long as data flows into the enclave, even the source of the data, like if you have an Azure virtual machine, if you have hosted a, uh, an enclave, even the uh, Microsoft cannot see what is inside your enclave. It, it remains totally hidden. There is confidential computing. You can run your com computations in that enclave and get the data back. Uh, everything hidden by com cryptography. So these are some very interesting cryptographic concepts. A uh, lot of research happening in this area. And this is what we have offered. Uh, So these are different aspects of of of, uh, of uh, uh, security and uh, data privacy that uh, uh, that are part of responsible AI. So finally, the, this is like uh, again I'm out of time here, but uh, I don't want to leave at least ten for questions. These are some of the uh, uh, some of the videos. I would highly encourage you to look at uh, by Dr. Mukta. There is a responsible AI and pillars, and my talk is heavily influenced by that. A lot of examples are from her talk, so you'll you'll get to see that. Uh, Amo gave, did a fantastic talk on privacy preserving machine learning techniques. It talks way more about federated learning, differential privacy, uh, some of the security measures. Uh, it's a very good talk. Uh, Shraddha from, from our team kind of uh, did a very good video on explainable AI, how, exp how explainable systems can be understood better some of the different examples like that uh, wolf and husky the pro publica example you can see some of those in that uh, in shadda's video and fi finally my talk on mq uh, that is where i actually found the uh, ci cd pipeline including explainability i think that will be helpful for some of you so uh, that was it uh, i hope this was used to get some questions I really want to, especially the student community, I really want to leave you with a message that this is a really hot upcoming field, responsible AI, ethical AI, and uh, you definitely need to think about this, especially and in industry, there's a big need for new thought in this direction. So as you are looking at these libraries, do give this a thought, and when you're coming uh, to, for to, for some of this interview discussion, in uh, sorry, industry, you definitely need to focus on uh, this aspect. So th th that was it. Uh, I'll 
pass on to sanket if we can uh, have some of these questions uh, sanket was the audible and uh, was yes 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 uh, thank you so much uh, tataraj i think it was very interesting even for someone like uh, me who is not from a technical uh, technology background to understand most of the things and it is really interesting to know how world is coming up with more of ethical and the right ways of conducting um, uh, businesses so before we move on to a lot of questions um, uh, one of the interesting question that i wanted to just take it as first and then we will we'll move on to the more of technology side of it uh, karan salian from um, he's a final year student from engineering mechatronics uh, he says sir what inspired you to move from core mechanical domain to software engineering in your career path what steps did you take oh <clears throat> thanks thanks karan for that question <clears throat> been a long time since somebody asked me that so uh, so actually uh, like i i i have been a mechanical engineer with goa engineering college and in my uh, back in 2000 and uh, i i was very interested in ml i mean lot of aspects in in uh, sorry in mechanical engineering in lot of aspects like thermodynamics i mean i think the core engineering the core statistics the operations research i think that was very uh, important but uh, even the mechanical systems i felt that we could there was software everywhere i mean there were cad packages fpa packages that were used was everywhere so i initially started with uh, cad systems we actually built as a final year project in goa engineering college we built a, a java based tool for automating finite element and this is still available on my website so so we kind of got into that and then uh, i kind of started feeling it was more automation design so even when i joined g uh, though i was more in a mechanical domain the focus was on software so i kind of uh, that is where my inclination went uh, automating mechanical systems so it was i was able to apply the best of both worlds my mechanical knowledge core engineering domain as well as uh, knowledge of uh, computer science which i self learned through uh, typically on materials online so i think that was made my inclination and then when uh, the data science world started going uh, big i mean we in mechanical engineering we have so much data that we collect i think where my uh, the core knowledge of statistics really helped me math and statistics and that helped me in this domain so thanks i mean that was a very good question surprising question thanks karan <laughs> thanks atraj right so now we are going to move on to um, a little more of from a technology side um, the first question that we got and it may not be in the right order atraj so excuse me for that okay <laughs> so it says uh, there's some anonymous uh, person does not mention the name uh, here she says can a gan be used to generate anything like for example melodious music mm. uh yes because uh, the, so gan basically is a generative adversarial network so uh, conceptually a gan can be used for anything because the the core essence of a gan is you have a generator and an adversary the generator will generate content the adversary will try to uh, uh, sorry the adversary will generate content and the discriminator will try to divide the content and say it is true or real or so you can it has been predominantly apply to any domain as long as you follow the core architecture so as you have generator which is generating content you have some real content to compare against the generator and then the the discriminator which is <coughs> going to separate your content into uh, real or fake and then Uh, the ultimate objective is that your generator becomes so good that it can generate uh, content that is distinguishable and then your uh, discriminator becomes so good that it, it is very good at discriminating and that's the power of how the uh, gan will uh, learn so conceptually you can apply to anything in fact i i believe uh, it may have been applied for text also so melodious music definitely as, as long as you can, uh, again i say content here because as long as you can take images basically in a way of pixels so as long as you can take your uh, music or your text and convert it into some encoding which is an array of pixel, pixels or sorry which is an array, then that array you use to generate your content and i i hope that answered your question okay. certainly um so the next one i think it's more of a yes or no but uh, maybe you can elaborate if required uh, are deep fakes illegal <laughs> well uh yeah that's a, not a, a difficult to answer uh, it's possible to generate deep fakes so there is a lot of uh, lo i mean it's not i wouldn't say it's illegal you can have a you can take one of these research papers there are so many of them and you can 
can generate content using approach like gens so you can generate a content now that's a deep fake a deep learning model generating a fake image now the, the i guess the illegality comes in because you are using somebody else's images to train your model so using celebrity pick to train model so uh, i i don't think right now as of now it is not a, it is not fake it is not illegal but then there are if you are going to use it in like some to cause some um, uh, some illegal activities i mean that's when it becomes a legal issue so uh, it's not a, I, i don't know honestly the answer to that <laughs> okay all right yeah. so the next one is which method will be efficient for decision making using single ai or using multiple ai trained for different attributes that decision make decision is made on the majority of votes if you want i'll read yeah. it back uh, one more time yeah sure <clears throat> yeah which method will be efficient for decision making using single ai or using multiple ai trained for different attributes where decision is made on majority of votes yeah so first before i answer the question i mean your phrasing of this question uh, which is more efficient for decision making now that's a very loaded term i mean if you are looking at accuracy uh, then probably uh, a boosting approach would be more uh, effective like what you are describing is uns- ensembler algorithms so you can either have multiple algorithms like a tree uh, multiple algorithms and then do an averaging of the prediction or you could do a boosting where you take features and combine them together and make a strong classifier so if you are looking at accuracy when you say efficiency of decision making then i probably think a multiple uh, ensembling would be a better approach again it depends on the case there may be cases where a direct uh, tree classifier random forest may give you a good result but then uh, when you say decision making you have to look at the ethical aspects also I mean, you don't want to be unfair and you don't want to look at uh, 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 things that are un, uh, un, unethical to make the decision so when you look at the ethical aspect then you the explainability facts come into play so uh, if you if you have multiple models where you say you are looking at different features i would say if ethics uh, if you are considering ethics which is you should consider those features which are not uh, affecting your uh, uh, no, not affecting your uh, ethical implications or like we showed in the examples those were the features you would want to consider so depends on what you want for but accuracy i i agree with you you probably a boosting model will be more uh, more uh, efficient okay right all right so the next one i think it's uh, very typical uh, of um, technology it says how does ai work on lidar scanner or iphone 12 pro max yeah let's i think we lost you um, dattaraj Hi Smithy uh, anyone else is able to hear me Uh yeah I think you still hear me yeah, I back. lost my network Yeah 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 now you're back okay Yeah let me stop the camera because I have a weak network right now Um okay. and I'm st- stopping this uh, so the question was uh, how does uh, AI work for lidar uh, uh, images yeah. and the new iPhone 12 right Yeah. yeah so uh, typically for ai uh, it's not so much about what the content is lidar or no it's about the input is an array so an image you can take an rgb image and convert it into a three dimensional array the width height of the image and the three uh, third dimension which is the intensity of pixel rgb or rgba so lidar, uh, lidar will typically have a similar way of representing i don't know the exact details i believe we had seen it during the locovision days so uh, you can take a lidar image which is again will be some sort of an array three or four dimensional uh, array and you can take that uh, array and extract insights from it so your approaches typically will be the same you can still i believe you can still use convolutional neural networks or uh, even uh, fully connected layers uh, to process the image it's just the format of the image will be different and uh, there'll be a different kind of a uh the uh, the pre processing you needed will be different but other than that i think it's the pretty much the same way you will handle a uh, lidar image as a normal image okay all right so the next one is <clears throat> more to do with the biasness that you spoke about so uh there's no uh, sandeepan says even after us being careful 
such mistakes and biasness are avoided we can't uh, be for sure guarantee since ai is mostly a black box how can an user of the same know if the prediction should be accepted or manual investigation is needed yeah that's a good point so uh, typically uh, they we would handle this is you would uh, you you would want to look at your data set so this ai fairness 360 tool that i showed you you would want to look at run that analysis on a data set just to check if there are some uh, visible direct biases that appear in the data set so if you have <clears throat> so if you have attributes like sex or race now these are protected attributes you wouldn't want your classifier to be biased by those unless it's a specific application where these are important now typically what we do is we 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 would ignore those attributes but uh, that is called like i believe that is called uh, unseen the fairness but that doesn't really help because even if you un, uh, if you remove race and sex from a particular data set uh, the data set the other attributes which are important are linked to the to these protected attributes so you cannot really uh, you are just hiding it and you are not solving the problem so you want to keep them and make sure you are running fairness metrics you keep the protected attributes in your data set run the fairness metrics and see that your at least your data set is fair so that's a good way of uh, emphasizing to the to your customer that hey okay uh, now at least uh, my data my ml model is trained on a data set that is fair uh, other than that you can apply some of these explainable ai uh, techniques and uh, say that when when your model is making a decision the decision is made because of these features and not because of certain other features i mean these are the two things you can do right now uh, again it depends on uh, on what is the criteria your customer is looking for for fairness but uh, at least these two interventions can be done by you okay i hope that okay. answer the question sandeep okay so uh, the next one is what type of data is taken into account by face recognition ais uh so face recognition ai is uh, again the data is image data typically uh, so your images are like i said before images are like a three dimensional array of pixels you have the width height and the the number of channels in the image uh face recognition uh, one of the things i have seen recently uh, is a lot of them uses a new technique called siemens networks because there are so many faces uh, what they do is they take a face and they tr either try to build a a uh, network that will identify uh, landmarks on the face or they try to encode your face into an encoding and compare a different face to that encoding and match it so typically if you have this uh, face scanners at your entrance of your companies and all they typically use the second approach siemens network where they store instead of storing the entire image they just store some key encodings which represent your landmarks on the face so that when a new image comes uh, they will just take the same they will regenerate the same landmarks compared to a database and say this is the closest match to this person or it's the person is not a match again different implementations are different but this is typically what the data that facial recognition systems use okay all right um i think you would have answered this but let me just um, put it out what is the reason for bias in ai system is it because of the data set used uh so for an ai system uh, specifically for machine learning system yes it would be mainly for the because of the bias in the data uh, uh but in general as a software system if you if you consider th there could be multiple sources of bias now if you are learning from an ai system learns from data so like a machine learning model will be only be learned from data there won't be hard coded rules that you are putting in so then the data by the bias in the data directly flows into your uh, into your uh, Uh, model now you it could be an algorithm like a, a rule based thing where you can say that because of these features make a decision in that case it's actually a the developers bias that is already there and it may be unconsciously i mean you may say that uh, you deny loan for a uh, for person below 25 i mean that could be a rule somebody has put in a system i mean uh, just taking a hypothetical scenario but uh, now that probably is was true in certain ages but with time Uh, now people are uh, giving loans to different people but then such a rule will would not be a ethical rule so in this case the bias is part of the algorithm itself uh, so that could be bias because of the algorithm or because of the data set so data set bias these tools like ai fairness 360 can tell you for algorithm you'll have to look at uh, the actual uh, 
implementation look at the design and flow, uh, the workflow to actually figure out uh, uh, if the if the bias exists okay all right so the next one uh, comes up is uh, besides ethics and responsibility what skills we should develop to work as an ai engineer what steps should be taken uh, to take it as a career option yeah uh, yeah so uh, so i don't i don't want it to uh, sound like uh, only ethics and ai is the most important i think i think first is definitely you should focus on the core subject i would say start with the domain what interests you like in my case i started with the engineering domain uh, like the earlier question karan had asked uh, i i was very inter- i'm still interested more in the engineering domain and then uh, applying software and ai to the engineering domain was something that opportunity that i got through ge and now with persistent uh so i would say, say think of the problem that you would want to solve what excites you and then uh, focus on the actual uh, technology like you can look at uh, so ai there are different aspects there could be image analysis uh, which could be uh, uh, i mean you can look at ai for image analysis you can you could look at sequence models for natural language processing you could look at even pure machine learning now there are tools like h2o.ai which actually don't make you write any code uh you can actually just uh, using a web interface build a machine learning model so uh you could look at a coding approach where you are building neural networks learning python learning r or you could look at more of an application domain expert you know, where you can you are applying machine learning to solve certain uh, problem and then ai is something that uh, everybody is interested uh, i mean it has to come along with it i mean you need to know the principles of ai and then apply it accordingly so i would say focus on um, focus on the the particular problem that you want to solve with ai okay <clears throat> all right so we've got last two questions uh, probably if time permits for another couple of minutes we can take a few more if required but otherwise we were already overshot our time so the next one is what are the prerequisite to learn ai and why is the game theory important to ai these are the two questions that we have so if you want to just club them together uh, okay so yeah let me try to from them together in interest of time so uh, prerequisites i would say uh, knowledge of math and statistics would be very important uh, you have like i said you have technique uh, tools like h2o which can help you build uh, ml models without even knowing any background of math but uh, you need to know what is happening underneath at least to some level you need to know what precision recall means you need to know what a gradient descent algorithm is so i would say a uh, knowledge of statistics and mathematics is very important and that's uh, like a uh, if you are engineering student i mean that's i think uh, definitely part of your curriculum and even other uh, 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 courses i mean uh, i believe that is a major part of your uh, curriculum so that will be very important and then uh, you can look at whichever tool that you want to focus on like a pytorch tensorflow or even basic scikit learn and or even visual tools like h2o visual tools like h2o to actually uh, implement uh, some of these uh, Uh, algorithms the second question on game theory actually that was very specific one uh, so uh, the library that we use called shape uh, which is a shapely additive explanations uh, that uses game theory so the idea of game theory is basically with different players playing a game you try to do credit alloc- allotment to say which player is getting how much uh, and i'm not an expert by the way uh, which player is getting how much uh, importance or how much credit uh, so similarly uh, shape does the same thing that there are different features to make a decision a prediction by an ml model shape will tell you which feature is important so it will give a shape score to each of the features so every point in your training data set it will try to give a shape score and tell you this this is the importance of that particular uh, feature so and then combining that you can either get a local explanation that if you just have one decision you can know from the shape score which feature was given importance or you could get a global explanation where you have the full predictor or classifier you will know that uh this was the, uh, the, the these are the features of importance like that first uh, bar chart that i showed which showed uh, gender as an important that was a sh- that was used co- computer using shape scores which was ins- which are again games theory in- inspired so that that will say that uh, gender was the uh, was the most prominent feature in the second data set which is uh, un- which is uh, i mean w- w- which is true as far as the data set goes but it is ethically not true so that's how shape helps with the game theory okay so i think we'll go with the last one um uh it says which ai model would be better would be better when the data set is continuous stream of data from pir sg and uv sensors 
Uh, I'm sorry. What was the sensors again? I missed that. So it says which AI model would be better when the data set is continuous stream of data from PIR, SG, and UV sensors. Yeah, I am not very sure of those, but then I I think the question is more to do with the stream of data. So huh. uh, typically, uh, for a streaming data set. Uh, Uh, you you top, typically would do a time series analysis uh, so there are libraries uh, which can handle streaming data like today kafka is one of the prominent uh, 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 message brokers which can handle uh, thousands of messages a second and then you can apply either something like a spark streaming or storm or uh, uh, any of the streaming libraries and internally they have algorithms typically for time series forecasting where you can look at uh, changes happening certain uh, inflection points where uh, there is a change in the trend of your time series and highlight those points again depends on what exactly you are trying to do so if you are looking for certain events uh, you can look at uh, time series analysis which is very popular uh, and it's typically an anomaly detection te- technique so you handle a time series and find out certain anomalies that have happened and uh, or a trend that is happening and based on the trend you try, try to correlate to, to whatever pir or whatever the data set is trying to give you and uh, make a decision so that's your i mean that will be the without looking at your problem that will be my suggestion as a time series data series but then uh, there are other things that are also being prominent like there is this complex event processing where you have the small small events and you combine this co- multiple events and make it into a bigger event and in cyber security and other domains we tend to look at it that way Uh, there are sm- small small events that are happening and uh, which kind of give you indication of a bigger event that is that has happened but you don't have a direct signature to that so i would say to answer your question uh, long story short uh, time series forecasting and uh, complex event processing would be some of the areas where uh, you can apply ai to uh, series uh, uh, modeling okay so i'm going to take this last one from abdul um dataraj and then we can probably call it a day it says um, how effective can transfer learning be while dealing with natural language using large and heavy models of multiple convolution layers uh yeah thank thank you abdul for the question um, so uh, so uh, transfer learning so there, there are two aspects of it uh, first i'll touch upon the transfer learning transfer learning has shown that uh, for Uh, nlp data sets transfer learning is very effective in fact we uh, we have a research paper from persistent published in that domain where we clearly show that uh, using transfer learning is giving you definitely dedicated uh, better performance compared to uh, a regular uh, machine learning model uh, so t- transfer learning definitely has and especially today with a lot of uh, text so much text corpus that is being available through your tweets through your online articles etc so there is a lot more uh, text corpus today and uh, 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 using transfer learning on in fact one of the techniques in nlp that is being very prominent is pre training that is you are actually using uh, unlabeled text just to pre train your model and then you kind of fine tune on a particular uh, data set so that uh, that becomes very effective if you look at the modern models like transformers the gpt3 or t5 they they do pre train a lot on r- unlabeled text which is available in uh, plenty today and then they fine tune on a particular domain so transfer learning fine tuning pre training is very effective uh, your specific question on convolution probably may not be that uh, it may be a different topic because convolutions uh, I, i don't know, like some models like spacy they use convolution layers for text but uh, the modern architectures like transformers they heavily rely on this transformer uh, layer so they don't i don't think they use convolutions to that level somebody like spacy would use but even spacy is now moving back to uh, what do you say uh, uh, to, to to transformer layer so uh, i would say convolution will be very selective you'll have to do it look at it case by case basis but transfer learning fine tuning is definitely very effective uh, on uh, natural language processing good question abdul all right thank you so much uh, dattaraj i think it was a wonderful session we uh, a little overshot our time but i think that was okay in the la- in the larger interest of uh, students asking a lot of questions we've got a we've got quite a few more but i'm sh- i'm sorry for not being able to take all of them uh, but we will try and see if wherever we could uh, accommodate these questions you have uh, linkedin connection for dattaraj in case if you want to just connect with him for more 
understanding. But for otherwise, also you can reach out to us at campus at persistent.com and uh, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Insta uh, for our stories. And uh, we will be back with the next webinar text week series next month. Till then, I wish you all the very best. Do well, uh, stay safe and take care of yourself and your families. Till then, bye bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye.